Welcome back to another Wimbledon video. I'm continuing to think about formative assessments. And one of the things that our school's been looking at is developing different techniques for us to be able to tell what our students know. It's a simple concept and it can be incredibly difficult to get right. So I've been thinking and using Dylan Williams and many of the things that he talks about uh, when it comes to formative assessment. And one of the concepts we've been thinking about and trying, and we've just started, we're gonna do a lot more of this next term, are uh, hinge questions. Now, first of all, I, I heard this, and, and it's very easy to, to think that hinge questions, oh, it's just a different type of question that just is very similar to most other questions. But, but hinge questions are, in, crack, in fact, very different to a normal type of questioning in a classroom. They're questions that actually take quite a while to come up with, but they're very, very powerful. I'll give you a couple of, uh, some of the key characteristics of hinge questions, and I'll give you an example that I came up with a, uh, with a colleague, and hopefully it's a good one. I'm sure I'm very happy for people to critique it if needed, and for me to learn more, but a hinge question's got a couple of characteristics. It needs to be uh, very, very uh, quick in class. So multiple choice is the, is the format that you'd use and more than one correct answer in those choices. So I, I think five is a good number of possible answers and you can't have a student not knowing or kind of having wrong thinking and accidentally getting the right answer. So that's a key component of hinge questions. So if you've got A to E as your options, you might have B and E they need to both get these correct to show that they understand the essential learning that's taken place. Now that might seem simple, okay, all you're saying is uh, just have multiple choice and make sure it's really hard to get the right answer to, to, to check if they've got it. How is that so you know, powerful? Well, this is where some of the hard kind of thinking and, and graft of coming up with a really good hinge question is worth it. See, what you do is you think about the, the very common misconceptions around what you've taught them. So what you're then going to do is think through and go, well, if a student thinks this, if a student has this common misconception, this is how they'll answer that question. And what that does is that actually gives us an insight into what that student's thinking in a very quick moment in time. So it takes a while to come up with the question, but once you've asked it in class, you should have ready at your disposal a very quick way of knowing most of the class think the wrong thing about this and then you can concentrate on fixing up that misconception. So I'll, I'll give you an example very quickly. Uh, I'll, I'll put it up here. This was a, the hinge question. Which of these types of sources are biased? So this is for history and I, I discussed this with a colleague. Uh, she, she was not a history teacher so I had to explain a lot of the bias and the point of this hinge question is that bias is very complicated and students often uh, have misconceptions about it. They either think bias has to be intentional or they think bias is wrapped up with authenticity and reliability. And so they'll say things like, uh, this is a primary source, therefore it's biased, therefore it's unreliable and things like that. And you have to kind of tease out of, and it's really difficult at times to, to get that. So the point of this question is, a, B, C, D, and E are all correct. Bias is in everything. So hopefully a student answering A, B, C, D, and E will understand this concept of bias. But if a student only answers one or two or three of those, I can tell based on what they haven't chosen where their misconceptions are about bias. So for example, number one letter to the editor, if, if they've not ticked that, then I know that letters to the editor uh, contain intentional bias. If they've picked C, a government propaganda poster, well, I'm thinking that they'll know that uh, there's, you know, that, that, that bias is, is trying to persuade someone of something, but they're getting confused because a government poster is, is reliable and authentic. So, so that's where they're getting mixed up. So, so here's an example where I haven't just gone, uh, there's two real answers here, and then it's just different different distractors that are kind of like it. I've thought about the most common misconceptions about bias. And so with the snapshot of the class, I'm able to go, okay, half the class got all five answers, that's brilliant. But of the other half, you know, 90% of those those guys did 
A and B. So there's the areas that I ne really need to fix up and no one didn't answer E and D, so I know that everyone gets that. So it's giving me information and that's actually the point of a hinge question. It's actually giving the teacher data, real hard evidence based on what you've taught and what you've thought about what you're teaching. So this is linked to a learning intention and, and success criteria. So you're able to then use that evidence to decide what to do next in class. And that's where the power is of a hinge question.